Well, thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the Friday Reporter Podcast. Today, I am super lucky to catch Contessa Brewer, who is with CNBC as a correspondent. She covers, I mean, every major news story that's out there. She's a national Emmy award-winning journalist and, uh, among other things, making great time for this podcast. Thank you, Contessa, so much for making time for us today. I'm so glad to be with you, Lisa. I um I have to ask right off the bat, how does a girl from New England who goes to school in New York uh, get to be doing the great work that you're doing today? Oh, I mean, number one, you got to hit the jackpot. So not everybody does. And I just, I got lucky. I really did. Being in the right place at the right time um, and meeting the right people. But when I started, I didn't know anybody and I really did not understand the power of networking. You know, when I was a, a kid in Maine, I wanted to be an actress, but um, I'm the daughter of a Baptist preacher and uh, there wasn't a lot of money to go around. And the one thing I knew is that I didn't want to starve. Mm. So I started thinking, well, what else could I do? And I was going to be a psychologist because everybody loved to tell me their problems. And I thought, well, I, you know, I could be a therapist and then I'll just do community theater on the side. Uh So I decided to go to Syracuse, not because it had an amazing broadcast journalism school, but because I visited in the summertime and people were throwing around a Frisbee on the quad. And it seemed like this is college. This is what it's supposed to be. And then I I got there and uh, one a high school teacher was like, you can't be a therapist. Only 5% of your patients will ever get better. And you're goal oriented. That will frustrate you to no end. So you can't do that. And then at Syracuse, when I tried to um, start taking theater classes, they said, no, 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 no. You can't take theater classes. You have to either major in it or nothing, but it's too intense. So both of those paths sort of shut down to me and I was already there. So what else could I do? (laughs) <laughs> well, I could be a reporter and I love it. And I love, and it turns out that there is a lot of <laughs> being a therapist that goes into this job. You know, yes. you take in the stories, you sort of process it, and then you have to bring them back out. Mm-hmm. But the other thing that I love is that this is a job that most of the time at the end of the day, you can put aside whatever happened the day before or that day, and you look forward to a fresh start the next day. Right. So it's very good for leaving the past in the past and and hoping that tomorrow is a better day or thinking about how you do it better tomorrow. Right. And and the good news is I would think based on the the coverage that you do is that a lot of times there's there's something new to report and something different. So as much as uh, meet my dog who's in the back of this video here. I love it. Um uh the um the story themselves, they build on each other, right? So every day is a little bit new, even though what you've learned the day before can be useful and helpful. um, You get to report on something new and different. But I have to ask, so much now of your coverage is on casinos and on gambling and on um, some other really interesting, how in the world did you find your way into that path? Well, uh, so I had been an anchor on MSNBC for many years many, many years. Mm -hmm. And there most, you know, it was a lot of politics. It was some breaking news, you know, bridges collapsing and natural catastrophes and things like that. That was my bread and butter. And that's what I knew. When I came to CNBC, they asked me, uh, is there a particular area you'd like to focus on? And I said, yes, I want to focus on the environment and climate change because it affects all the companies that we cover at CNBC. It's something that businesses really have to um, plan for and be strategic about how they're going to address it. They said, yeah, how about casinos? (laughs) And I, I, I loved it because my very first job in television was in Reno, Nevada. Oh my I was in and out of casinos. I know mm-hmm. casinos. Casinos are a business that you can understand. And I came in before the Supreme Court overturned what's known in the industry as PASPA, which is the basically the federal law that kept states from legalizing sports gambling. When the Supreme Court overturned that, it completely changed the industry that I cover. And it's it's growing like crazy. Oh my gosh, the players yeah. are so interesting. Um And for me personally, it's so interesting to be able to dive into subject matter and become expert 
at this thing rather than, I, I mean, I still cover a little bit of everything, but, but now if there's a story about gambling, I'm your person yeah. and I know something about it. And, and it, that has been really fun for me um, to, to grow and develop depth of knowledge instead of just breadth of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Well, you did for so long, you had um, your own show and you did that every single day, right? I mean, you know, give or take, there would be days where people would step in for you, but how is that different from what you're doing now? Does this give you a little more flexibility to really dive in and get deeper into the story? Talk, talk to me a little bit about the difference between the two, if you will. I have way more lunches uh. in restaurants <laughs> now awesome. than I did when I was anchoring a daily show on yeah. MSNBC or CBS or wherever I was. Um, it's, it's both, it's liberating. As I said, you know, it's almost like I've come to CNBC and I had an MBA on the job. Uh -huh. On the other hand, I don't have my own real estate unless I'm filling in for someone, right. which, um, which happens here, but I don't have my own real estate anymore to say, this is what I think is important. This is what I think I'm in, I'm in, you know, is interesting. And this is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I won't lie. I really liked having my own show so that the things that I thought were important for my viewers and my audience to know I could do. Now I've gotten very good at being a pitcher, you know, uh, but having a really great sales pitch about why my story or why the content that I want to bring you, the interview or whatever it is, why it matters to you, the show and to you, the viewer. And um, I, I do feel like I could make, I could probably go back to being a much better Avon lady than I was at 15 when I first did that job. <laughs> It's so, but it's the, the ebb and flow in the business too is, is very much, you know, it's very much a, a change over time, right? I mean, you're growing right now in this space. You'll go back to having a show. You'll do other things. I mean, it's so interesting, but you're also creating some really cool content yourself on your own blog. Like it looks to me like you're also not only reporting on, you know, in the tr traditional sense, but you're also looking for ways to talk about other issues. Is that right? Well, I, you know, I think that one of the, charities that I support and I'm very active with is called Saving Mothers. And I, um, I think it's so incredibly important and enlightening. So that's been a place where not in my day job, but in my, so on my social media feed, I can talk about that and my own story and why I care so much about it. Mm -hmm. um, I was an early adopter of social media. Like I, it, 2007, 2008, I started using Facebook and Twitter and incorporating it into my show every day because I thought this whole voice of God, where the news anchor is coming and telling you, it was almost like being in a pulpit, right? You're, you're the preacher and you're telling the world what they need to think. That's right. I thought that was really outdated and that people wanted to have a voice in the content they were consuming. <laughs> So that was, you know, a long time ago. Now yeah. I find that I'm kind of over it. Yeah. Do you I know what I mean? Yes, I, yes, I do. I am not addicted to it. I am not scrolling through everybody else's social media feed. So if you, Lisa, say to me, hey, Contessa, did you, what, what do you mean you missed my big update about a job change? It was, I put it up on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, oh, I totally missed it. Yeah. I don't know that that's the best approach business wise. But I do think as our, for our society and for our collective human brain development, it would probably be good if we could all put our phones down. Oh man, I totally, yes. Amen. All day long. Amen. <laughs> because I think that um, it's also good to look out from that. So you're right. I mean, tw uh, tw you know, 2007, when people were all starting to figure out if this was the way we were going to go that was a new trend. That was a new piece, right? And now everything that's old is new again. In fact, I was just talking to somebody the other day that, that works in politics, has worked in campaigns for a long time. He said, you know, for so long, we were trying to figure out how to hack into, you know, how to get into phones, like how to be someone's text or be someone's email. And let's face it, you and I both, though I'm immediate unsubscribe. I mean, I can't even be any more annoyed by all of that. He said, we're getting back to regular letter writing in the slow, you know, in the snail mail. He said, we're getting back to, you know, 
old things that were once useful are new again. So you're a soothsayer. I mean, you're seeing ahead of the curve on this because I think people are tired of, of that as a, as a medium. Oh, and also, I mean, the pandemic gave us opportunities to just live mm-hmm. in the virtual world. And I personally did not miss uh, coming into the office and seeing people. And I didn't really feel like this yen to get back to lunches with sources and, and contacts in my industry and all of that. What I find though, now that I'm back to doing it is that one, it does feed my soul in ways that I didn't realize I was missing. Mm -hmm. And, and two, that the ideas that it's sparking and the brainstorming that happens where you're not picking up the phone or getting on a Zoom call. I mean, this works for us to sit in a box and face each other. And how amazing that we have the technology to do this. However, if you and I were sitting in a studio together, we would be able to feel each other's um, energy and be able to read each other's body language. And there might be chat before the interview or after the interview that sparks ideas in both both of us and helps us to move forward. Totally agree. I mean, and that's, I, I've said it a hundred times before, but that's why I started the podcast because I couldn't get to those source meetings, right? I couldn't have conversations and I, and that's really, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the public affairs space. I mean, that's a big part of what I do for my clients is like being able to say, like I had a conversation with the Washington Post and this is the direction they're going or CNBC is working on a big piece on this particular economic move that's happening in the, in the tech world. I mean, those are things that were not happening. So I started this primarily out of that interest in connecting with my colleagues and my friends and folks like yourself. Um, but also too, because I needed that connection just a little bit, right? I needed to connect back with folks because I felt like I was living in this little space. How are you finding it to try and distinguish yourself in the crowded field? I mean, there's so many, there's one, there's so many podcasts to choose from, but also there's so much content competing for attention. You know, For this particular podcast, I have found my expectation is not that everyone is going to listen to every 100 episodes that I've done. Uh, But I will say that for those who really care about Contessa Brewer and her reporting, they're going to listen. For those who want to hear about what's happening at the Washington Post, or I had uh, a woman, Chelsea Janes, who covers uh, uh, the Nationals and Major League Baseball. I had her on right after the World Series. I have had different people from different segments of, of journalism that talk about specific parts of the work that they do that has been interesting. And so for me, I'm really not trying to boil the ocean. I'm actually trying to help folks understand what journalists care about. And um, in particular, the one thing, Contessa, that I've found to be the most useful is that I've heard from a lot of um, younger press secretaries on Capitol Hill, for instance, who came onto the job during COVID and were not able to get to know and be sources to reporters. And they listened into what Paul Kane had to say, and they listened into what John Brezhnehan had to say, or, you know, whoever it is, Anna Palmer, like some of these extraordinary people that are walking in the halls that ordinarily they'd run into over coffee or something else. Um, And they felt like that alone gave them enough information to be able to open a conversation and be able to make a connection. So for me, uh, you know, it's just a little corner of the podcast world. There are, I mean, tens of thousands of podcasts. Um, But I also feel like for me, it's just a great networking opportunity. And I get an opportunity to get to know a little bit more about, you know, now I know that if I have a story about gaming, or really just about anything relative to CNBC, I'm going to check in and and let you know that it's happening, whether it's helpful or not, I'll be able to say, this is something that that I'm following. And you'll be able to say, oh, Lisa and I have a connection outside of the fact that she's just calling me to pitch her story. You know, what's really interesting, too, is that I've seen a change over my career in the um, loyalty of the audience in that when I was 25 and an anchor in Palm Springs, California, I was very well known in that very small market. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when I would drive into valet at the Ritz Carlton in my old beater that my grandmother had given me. (laughs) the ballet knew my name. Mm-hmm. When I moved to Milwaukee, it was a news town where people watched the news. And so really my only competition for attention was were the athletes playing for the Milwaukee Bucks or the Green Bay Packers or the Brewers. 
And so everywhere I went in Milwaukee, people knew me. Wow. It was only after I moved to national news in New York that I could go places with complete anonymity. And the more the the more the internet has grown, the more streaming options there are, the less um, loyal or intent the viewers are for me. I feel like even there, people with a big platform find that there may be dilution in the amount of power they wield with their audience. Mm-hmm. And that, and that f- both for on, you know, for on-air talent, for media brands, mm-hmm. it's something that requires constant innovation. And it's one reason why you see this pushing of the envelope, trying harder and harder to break through the noise mm-hmm. and to tell your audience, hey, we're over here, we matter, and here's something you haven't seen before. And it's just moving faster and faster and faster. And so maybe you're right. Like maybe, maybe we're at the point where slower and calmer is better. Well, if it's better, I like it that way. Um, <laughs> and, and if it's not better, then I'm okay with that too. Like there's a, there's yeah. a little something for everyone out there. Right. And I think that that's a big piece of, of that. Um, just the regular, the people are going to their social channels there. People are able to curate their, their, their newsfeed, right? The things that they care about. So things you and I might care about because we're raising small humans and trying to make sure that they're off to school and doing their life. Um, other people may not care about quite as much. And I find that that alone, like you said, that you may or may not see someone's job announcement. Well, that also has something to do with the way that the social media platforms work too, with their um, absolutely algorithms and some of the other things. So a lot of times you and I may be not even seeing something because it's not in our direct line of view. And that's, you know, so I've decided that I'm not, I'm not trying to boil the ocean. There are plenty of people, big networks in the world that are trying to do that. I'm just having a conversation once a week with some great people who do great work. So I'm cool with that. (laughs) I love that. I love that. Uh, But tell me, so when you're not reporting and you're not doing the work you do, uh, I know you have a busy life outside of journalism. What keeps you busy? Well, uh, you alluded to my little humans and my little humans are getting very big. I have nine-year-old twins. Um, They are, you know, incredibly intelligent. If there's a sliver of a gap in the logic that I present to them, they spot the gap and they rip it wide open. And so that's, it's keeping me on my toes. And mostly I feel like if I'm dealing with this when they're nine, what am I going to be in for when they're 16? Um, I, I, I'm involved with charity. I do a lot, but my work, you know, my work takes up a lot of my time Mm -hmm. and I go through phases where, you know, what interests me, what interested me, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, I was, I built my own house. Like literally I did it. I I know Mm -hmm. you're, you're thinking right now, like, okay, you hired that. No, no, no. I poured concrete countertops. I laid wood floors. I installed wood ceilings. I, I did it. I never want to do that again. Like I did that. It was super fun. It gave me, now I'm ready for something new. So yeah. this is the other thing. I think that as a journalist, maybe I do have um, problems with attention because I'm so accustomed to being able to dive into something new oh, every wow. day <laughs> <laughs> that, that for me to stick to something for, you know, two years, that's going to seem like, I mean, I've at parenting I've stuck with. So that's good. I'm like nine you years no in. It's going pretty friend. well. <laughs> <laughs> you have no choice. Uh, and I will fast forward. I have an almost 17 year old and a 15 year old. It uh, they keep you on your toes, but it gets great. And I think they keep us they keep us good at what we do, especially if the, if they're examining your argument and they're saying like I'm not so sure. I had my kids <laughs> ask me questions about a variety of things, and I said, you know, it's funny. We've always thought about it as adults, we've always, always thought about it this way, because this is how we've done it. And they'll just, they'll unpack it for you and just say, huh, well, that's a different way to look at it, isn't it? So it's fun. It keeps you very busy. Um, this house you built is not the house you lost in Sandy though, is it? So, uh, my, I lost my apartment in New York city in Sandy, my condo. Hmm. Um, and boy, was that eye opening because as you might imagine, I've covered a lot of storms where people have lost everything. Yeah. Yeah. And so when it happened to me, one, I knew it was going to happen. I knew, I knew given, you know, where I'm situated and what the 
uh, forecast had been for the storm surge and all that, I, I just, I knew I was going to get flooded. I didn't realize I would get flooded to the extent that I was or that I would lose as much as I did. And I didn't anticipate that it would hurt so much to lose, you know, letters from, that my great grandfather had written me or the stuff that I'd been collecting for my whole life. Yeah. On the other hand, it was a great lesson in how much we lug around with us mm-hmm. that we don't need. It's not important. All it does is weigh us down. And when you get rid of it, it provides an opportunity for a fresh start in ways that you could not have imagined. And so while I was displaced from my apartment and, and the building was undergoing um, repair and, and restoration, I got pregnant with the twins. And what we did was we completely rethought the way that the apartment was configured mm-hmm. because there was no room for babies while, you know, in the previous apartment. And when we came back in and we redid the floor plan, now I have a room, which the children are rapidly outgrowing. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. And, and no, that's been in the, in the house, um, in the woods, which I built, I feel like has saved us over and over and over again. I never, I wasn't one of these kids who grew up um, ever being exposed to people who had more than one home. That to me was far-fetched and like, that's what rich people did. In New York, it's pretty normal because you live in a box this big. Mm -hmm. And so if you can, the ability to spread out and to get into nature is really valuable. Uh, and, And I love it. And I don't think it's necessarily the wisest financial choice, but um, being in nature and being able to, I'm in the pandemic, yeah. being able to hike and, and see water mm-hmm. and hear birds and just feel stillness was so nurturing. Yeah. Well, especially because we were forced to be on electronics for so much of our day. Yes. Being able to disconnect was so, so important. Um, I have to ask though. You've also moderate, or you've also uh, been an audiobook. You've done several audiobooks, that, that, <laughs> but like, yes, but how narrator, you, uh, you've done a yeah. few now, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. And now I look back on the ones that I did and I think, oh no, I could do it so much better now. Oh. I, I, I love audiobooks. I was an early adopter of Audible back in, I think. I signed up for an Audible account in 2000 and they would give you, if you had signed up for a membership, they would send you this little MP3 player that I, I remember this, it, it had, you could get 128 megabytes of information on the MP3 player. Oh, so wow. if you had a long book, you would have to really lower the quality and you could only download, you know, chapters at a time. You couldn't download the whole big book. Yeah. So once, um, uh, you know, Audible at one point had gone public and it was like, the, the stock was like 40 cents or something crazy. I, I called up the CEO and I introduced myself and I said, listen, you know, I'd love to meet you. I've been a fan of Audible for so long. Awesome. So I went over and I'm chatting with him just about how much I love the product. And then I said, I, you know, he said, would you ever want to narrate a book? And I said, yes. So, so I went over, I went to Audible. I had an audition. They started me off because they said, well, is there, what do you think fiction or nonfiction? I'm like, Oh, fiction. Definitely. I love to listen to fiction. (laughs) They gave me like, uh, probably some Harlequin romance kind of thing to read. And they said, okay, okay. Read a couple paragraphs of that. Here's a nonfiction book. And I read that and they said, stop, stop there. You're going to be our not, you're going to marry nonfiction. (laughs) How about that? I'm not not an actor. However, I think I could be. And so, (laughs) so now I want to call them back up and say in my spare time, I want to come back. And now I really want to read. A Why not juicy... those early theater days? Bring them back, right? Yes. I mean, yes, you can. Forget those people <laughs> in Syracuse who said you can't. Of course you can. But it's hard work. You know, it narrating, I bet. it requires so much energy. And you're sitting in a voice, like you're going to sit here with me and do this interview and go back and edit it down. I mean, if you think about it, an audiobook could be seven hours. It could be 13 hours. It could be that those are all significantly more hours of talking time for the narrator and for the producer slash engineer who's our editor, who's yeah. putting that all together. So it, so it's time consuming. I love doing it. And, um, you know, I'll, yeah, I'll just put it. If anybody wants me to narrate your 
fiction. This is book. a help wanted offer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ring me I up. It. I love it. Well, Contessa, we're getting to the end of our conversation and I could talk to you for another hour. I'm so grateful for your time, but I have to ask who, who should I talk to next for the podcast? Oh, you got to talk to my friend, Jessica Gomez, who is a correspondent for matter of fact. And she does some incredible storytelling. She's, um, and she, she is probably one of the best storytellers I've ever encountered in my entire career. And she does impactful work. Also, she's super funny. Um, and I've known her for a long time and she's, uh, she's based out of Wisconsin, but she travels all over for matter of fact with Soledad O'Brien. Awesome. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to tell her that you nominated her. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm so, so grateful for your time today. And I hope that you get a little bit of time away this weekend. And Contessa, thank you. Thank you so much. Lisa, thank you. So great to know you. You too.